Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Leary, and I'm uh, happy to be able to welcome you to the uh, latest in the occasional, if irregular, uh, public meetings of the Public Interest Declassification Board. Uh, we're always amazed how many of you turn out when we <laughs> schedule one of those meetings, and we're delighted. Um, <clears throat> I know that most of you know what the PIDB is, but just to refresh your memory and for the benefit of uh, any newcomers uh, who may be here, uh, the Public Interest Declassification Board was established by Congress. Its members are appointed by the President and the leadership of Congress. And we had two broad, very complementary missions. Our first mission is to promote the fullest, promptest access to the classified record of the United States government, which is, of course, a large part of the history of the national security and foreign policy of the United States. <clears throat> Our second very complimentary mission is to advise the president uh, and uh, the rest of the executive branch on how to improve the process of classification and declassification in order to better accomplish that first overarching objective. <clears throat> Our meeting this morning is going to focus on what we think are some really rather exciting developments related to that setting objective, how to improve the process. Uh, and also, we're going to talk a bit about uh, our plans for our next study, our next project, to uh, try to come up with some recommendations for uh, encouraging uh, greater use of uh, technology to aid in the process of declassification. Uh, my, my first task, my first very happy task this morning, is to welcome uh, the two newest members of uh, the Public Interest Declassification Board, Laura DeBonis, Laura, want to stand, and Saul Watson. Uh, Laura has over 20 years experience in the information technology and media fields. She currently serves as a founding board member for the Digital Public Library of America, an organization devoted to creating an open network of online resources from libraries, archives, and museums, and making them freely available to all. Sounds very pertinent to our mission. Uh, her professional experience includes a variety of leadership roles at Google, including her last position there as Director of Library Partnerships for Book Search. Welcome, Laura. Uh, Saul uh, Watson has a long and distinguished uh, career at the New York Times Company, beginning in 1974, uh, and he uh, retired, I think, as a senior vice president and chief legal officer of the New York Times Company. Uh, Saul, Saul has also been a special master in the appellate division of the New York State Supreme Court and is a member of the American Bar Association, the National Bar Association, and the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. From 1966 to 1968, he served in the U.S. Army as a lieutenant in the military police corps. Welcome, Saul. <clears throat> uh, now I want to uh, yield the podium uh, to Ambassador Nancy Soderberg, who will uh, walk us through the rest of this morning's program. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming, and thank you, Bill Leary, for opening us up for what's going to be, I think, an exciting day, and particularly glad to have Laura and Saul with us um, as full members of this uh, great team. 
I think we're going to have a really informative session, um, an interesting discussion, comments from the public, our very distinguished uh, guests that we're having. And the purpose of this meeting is to continue our advocacy for the transformation and modernization of the classification and declassification system. Simply put, it is not workable under the current system and needs technology in order to meet the public's right to know what its government does. Um, our last supplemental report, which you can get on our website, Setting Priorities, an Essential Step in Transforming Declassification, uh, revisits uh, one of our recommendations to the President for transformation, and that's the focus of today's discussion, which is to encourage the development and the use of existing and new technologies to assist those declassifying and classifying information at the agencies for the National Declassification Center. And this morning, we're excited to hear from our distinguished speakers in what strides that they have made and are seeking to make in support of our recommendation. And once again, we're delighted to have our wonderful friend and our distinguished archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, uh, join us as our host. Um, there is no better supporter of our work than David, and he's been a longtime advocate for advancing access initiatives within government. As archivist of the United States, David is a, leading, a leader in fostering policies to support a more open and transparent government. His record demonstrates that. He encourages the movement of government and the National Archives from the analog age to the digital information age. And he recognizes the need to design new processes and policies to ensure citizen access to records of our government and I'm especially impressed with his many successes in building partnerships that will greatly improve public access to government information. So let me ask uh, our archivist, David Ferriero, to come up and say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, and good morning, all. Welcome to my house. Um, <laughs> I'm extraordinarily proud to be the archivist of the United States, leading the National Archives as we strive to promote open government and transparency for the benefit of our democracy. As caretakers of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, we hold the words, we the people, in high esteem and take seriously our responsibility to preserve and make available the billions of government records we hold in trust for the American people. Innovate to make access happen is our flagship open government initiative. We continue to take actions to improve transparency, participation, and collaboration in every aspect of the work we do here at the National Archives, while embracing innovation and developing best practices to carry out our mission for the benefit of the American people. The Public Information Declassification Board plays an important role in promoting open government by continuing to advocate for policy improvements that support greater public access to government information of historical significance. The members have repeatedly recognized publicly the growing challenge facing the government agencies in today's digital information age, and the board has been a strong proponent of modernizing antiquated policies and practices, often inhibiting access to our records. The board's December 2012 report, Transforming the Security Classification System, described these challenges in detail and offered thoughtful recommendations that if implemented will modernize and improve information management overall, including the expedited declassification of national security information. The board's 2014 supplemental report, Setting Priorities, expanded on one element critical to transformation, prioritizing records of historical significance for declassification, and I'm pleased to say that the National Archives Declassification Center has already begun the process of reevaluating how it prioritizes reviewing records for declassification. After successfully retiring a backlog of over 351 million pages of records, the NDC now has an opportunity to rethink how it may improve its operations and prioritize records for declassification review so that the most significant to the public and are processed first. 
At the April 15th NDC Public Forum, Director Cheryl Schenberger outlined next steps in prioritization at the NDC and heard comments from public interest groups, scholars, historians, and advocates, including board member Bill Leary. We heard proposals for process improvements and suggestions of records for a prioritized, prioritized declassification review. I know the NDC will consider and apply many of the recommendations made at the public forum, and we intend to find innovative means to improve upon our success thus far. Improving access to historically significant records, however, requires more than just finding a means to prioritize records for review, as the board recognized in both of its reports. In order to innovate and make access happen, we must seek out opportunities to integrate new and existing technology into our information management practices. The board shares this belief. It's been a long-standing advocate for the increased use of pilot projects in order to build partnerships across agencies and reach our common goal of improving how the government manages its information, both in declassification and records management in general. These declassification and records management policies are practices and practices are inherently linked, and the board's acknowledgement of this important principle helped shape many of the commitments found in the president's second open government national action plan. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States, Mr. Alex McGilvery, to this public meeting. This is um, somewhat of a reunion. Um, Laura Demonis, AMAC, as he's known in the industry, and I were joined at the hip during the Google Book Project when I was at the New York Public Library. So it's great to have both of you in the room. AMAC will discuss the technology policy initiatives underway at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. His efforts to leverage technological talent and expertise of individuals and teams across the government are critical to modernizing records management, data management, and declassification processes. I'm sure he will, have, he will have important commentary on the newly established United States Digital Service and its mission to transform the way the government works for the American people. I welcome research scientist Dr. Cheryl Martin from the Center for Content Understanding, who has completed pilot projects at the Applied Research Laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin on behalf of the National Archives and the CIA. We at the National Archives and CIA have partnered with Dr. Martin and her team in an effort to find technological solutions to assist declassification, declassifiers in their decision making to improve the outcomes of reviews. Dr. Martin will outline these results of those pilot projects, which to date are the only pilot projects of this level of sophistication in existence that focus first and foremost on improving declassification and access to government records. I look forward to hearing more about the impressive achievements of these pilot projects during Dr. Martin's presentation. We will learn today about the latest cutting edge technological capabilities and modernized government policies that support innovation. These advancements are critical to our work at the National Archives, but the uniqueness of our mission does not afford us the luxury of only looking forward. As we prepare and work towards solutions in managing digital records, we must also find innovative and effective means to manage the billions of pages of paper records still being created across all areas of government. The sheer volume of information in need of management whether found in paper records, born digital records, digitized records, or special media, will continue to shape how we do our business. To this end, I'm encouraged by the progress we at the National Archives and at agencies have made under the direction of our Chief Records Officer, Paul Wester, in response to the President's Managing Government Records Directive. As we work in collaboration to modernize our government's information management practices overall, we must remember to identify and understand the many facets to this challenge and view potential solutions from a high level vantage point, working to make changes that are automated and scalable to the benefit of all information users. I want to thank PIDIB, the agencies, the public interest community, and everyone joining us here today for contributing to this morning's discussion. Critical to the success of our transformation efforts is the continued open dialogue we share with our stakeholders inside and outside of government. This engagement is essential to help us improve our services and help us serve our democracy by providing access 
to the highest value government records. Thank you for your efforts and support on our mission and our work. Uh, thank you, David, and really thank you so much for your continued support of, um, of our work as well as uh, on behalf of the archives. Um, as David mentioned, we have a fantastic um, lineup for you this morning, uh, both with Cheryl and, and Alex. And uh, we're going to next hear from Alex McGilvery, who's the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States. And in his first full day of office, um, which you can take full credit for, the President created the U.S. Chief Technology Officer position. Uh, within the White House Office of Science and Technology to lead the administration-wide effort to unleash the power of technology, data, and innovation to help meet our nation's goals and the needs of our citizens. As Deputy CTO, AMAC, I guess he's called, um, focuses on a portfolio of key priority areas for the administration, including the intersection of big data, technology, and privacy. He's an internationally recognized expert in technology, law, and policy. And prior to coming to the White House, he served as general counsel and head of public policy at none other than Twitter from 2009 to 2013. And he's an actively practicing developer and coder, uh, contributing to his ability to formulate creative and sensible technology policy and understanding its ramifications better than certainly I can, I'm sure. Um, but we're excited to hear about your assessment of the new information technology needs of the government and how we can leverage technology talent to modernize records management, data management, and uh, declassification. So welcome, AMAC. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and thank you to the uh, PDIB. Um, this is, uh, it's wonderful for me to be here, uh, particularly wonderful to be uh, uh, sharing a stage with um, the archivist who I admire uh, so much both for his work here and for his work as a librarian at NYPL, uh, MIT, and I think Duke before that. Um, but um, uh, having negotiated uh, with him uh, while I was at Google, I can also say that he can be quite a pit bull for his particular cause. <laughs> um, <laughs> And he's often right, which is extremely annoying uh, when you're on the other side. Uh, but um, but I would say that one of the one of the reasons why this is a thrill for me is uh, the thing that's motivated me most throughout my career is access to information. And so this particular uh, both the archive and this board really embodies that and embodies it in a way that's not um, so it's not trivial. There are plenty of places where uh, you can talk about access to information, and there's no. Um, downside. There's no other um, other interest at issue, and this is a place where you're really dealing with where the rubber meets the road and trying to understand that tension um, and to get through it to actually get to the access to the information, um, which is extraordinarily valuable. I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, techies and government uh, and the administration's commitment to open, open government, so I'll do that and um, and probably touch on a few other things as well. The um, so the, the president, as uh, the ambassador said, right from day one was focused on how do you bring more technology and expertise into government. And that's uh, why the CTO's office was created. It was sort of a vestige from a very successful campaign that changed the way campaigning was done uh, in terms of bringing more technology understanding into how to run a campaign and get it, uh, and get it through. But that um, it was uh, a, a, a thing that was a focus, but maybe not a principal focus over time until the healthcare.gov uh, problems happened. And I think the thing that healthcare.gov brought home um, for our administration, I mean, more than anything else, was this idea that you couldn't really do policy anymore in a vacuum without understanding implementation, and particularly without understanding that implementation in technology. Um, obviously, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act was law at that time, but by itself, it wasn't going to be able to create its goal of enrolling more Americans in healthcare. Uh, and so the, the idea that technology was gonna be responsible for that, and so we had to get the technology piece right. And that would mean bringing in technologists, having them work on the problem, get it over the finish line, but also bringing them in earlier and earlier into these policy processes to have a better marriage between that policy and technology goal was really important. And so to that end, the, the thing that is, um, that sort of the techies in government right now is focused on 
is really three principal areas. So the first is that policy implementation, making uh, government services world class. Uh, one way to think about this is we have um, some of the best, most innovative uh, technologists within the United States. We have people who've created Amazon and, and Google and Facebook and Twitter and all these other great services that we rely on every day. And we want to make sure that the government websites are just as good, that the government services get provided in just as much of an agile uh, and technology focused and user focused uh, way. And so there's a whole bunch of different people who are working on that. And I'm going to go into the different people working on the different parts uh, in a moment. Number two is really sort of the flip of that. How do you bring more technology understanding into policy formation? Um, and so that's certainly something that, uh, that is one of the focuses of the discussion here today. If you have the types of tools that Dr. Martin uh, will be talking about at your disposal, that might change the types of policies that you can put in place in terms of classification and in terms of getting material out into the public and providing that access to information. And that understanding of that interplay between the technology and the policy is really important um, and something that we're trying to push forward. And then the third um, thing that is in the broader techies and government uh, space is thinking about the engagement between the American people and their government and trying to understand ways in which we can use technology to change the way that engagement happens for the better. So to make it so that we can do more two-way conversation, so that we can ask more questions of the American people and have them give us answers that will help us govern better, so that we can have people become more engaged with their government and make change within their government in a more effective way. Um, and so there are a bunch of people now uh, working on that problem and trying to make it better, but it's also something that the president has been focused on since the beginning of his term um, with the launch of uh, We the People, uh, a campaign, uh, a way of allowing ordinary citizens to bring questions to government and get answers. Um, so now in terms of all of that, those different types of things that we're trying to do, I wanted to just bring you on a bit of a tour through the people that are doing it and the, the organizations that they are working with. Because uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard to unpack that and it is useful in understanding how we think about it. So, so it's everything from the uh, US CIO, uh, Tony Scott, who uh, came from uh, VMware, um, who is responsible for uh, government technology generally um, and is working across different government agencies with excellent CIOs and staff within agencies to uh, work on cross-government problems and to bring the best technology into government. Uh, it's people like Mikey Dickerson at uh, USDS. Uh, Mikey came from uh, Google. Uh, where he was an SRE, and the, the SREs uh, suffer reliability engineers. Those are the folks that um, make sure that a uh, site like Google stays up uh, near 100% of the time. And so he's a great person to bring into government and make sure our government services have that same type of reliability. Uh, but that USDS focus, so US Digital Services, and that word service is important uh, on a number of levels. First of all, recognizing that we're not no longer in government releasing products, where we're just releasing the product and then it exists, great people can use it, we can walk away and do something else. But we're really talking about services here, things that will last over time and that need to be updated and iterated on and maintained as services. It's also thinking about service as that word, uh, you know, the thing that brought me into government, uh, the ability to have purpose make impact. One of the things that Mikey is doing very effectively is winning recruiting uh, battles against much better funded um, uh, offers from Silicon Valley companies because he's able to appeal to an engineer's uh, sense of purpose. Uh, and there really is no better way to have an impact, have a really deep impact on individual Americans uh, than working within the federal government. So Mikey is, uh, is working that and really pushing that out within the US Digital Services. The other thing that the US Digital Services has done, especially this year, is move out into agencies. So there's now a VA digital service and we will have other digital services within agencies over time. Those are uh, groups that are working within agencies, bringing the excellent staff that we have already at agencies to bring some of this new style of doing work. Um, so for example, instead of putting a requirement out and then working over a course of five years to be able to launch something that becomes live to the public uh, at the five year anniversary mark, trying to be quick, agile, and launch and iterate. So being able to launch something, be able to do development in the, in the open, and then get it out there over time. Um, so that there's actually a better understanding of whether the project's going to be successful and so that we can course correct when we learn stuff in our implementation. Um, so that's USDS. 
Uh, a companion piece to that is 18F. 18F is within um, the GSA, uh, General Services Administration, and 18F is just a street address, 18th and F, and in, uh, it's not some sort of uh, top secret thing. Um, but 18F has a bunch of coders, I think they're about 150, 170 strong, um, who are working on doing the coding for services for the federal government. Um, and it's one of the great things about 18F is that as they encounter problems, there's often this, this issue in government where if nobody's done something, you don't really want to be the first to do the thing because there's a bunch of different costs that might come with that and you won't get to internalize all of the benefits. There's this free riding problem that lots of different people will be able to internalize the benefits, but you get to bear uh, all the costs. Um, and 18F has, as part of their mission, actually doing some of those first projects um, so that they can show by example, this, here's a way to use GitHub and from the very beginning develop a FOIA project in an open way that people can actually see what you're coding in real time. Uh, and to do some of those experiments and get them out there, but also to produce running services and to improve the services that government is offering. So that's 18F. Another uh, uh, project there is the Presidential Innovation Fellows. The way we think of these is sort of as innovators, entrepreneurs, and residents within agencies. These uh, PIF classes, uh, there have now been three of them. I think we're on our fourth. Um, and they basically come in as um, amazing people from uh, all over industry, academia, nonprofit space, uh, former, former government people too. They come in and then go back out to agencies and try to stir things up a bit um, and bring some of the, uh, the, those best in class processes and, and uh, technologies that back out to agencies. Um, on an even more uh, like operational level, uh, we brought in uh, David Recordin. David was a Facebook uh, engineer to be the director of White House Information Technology. We at the White House have the same problem as many uh, agencies in terms of how do we modernize the technology that, that we use? How do we make ourselves as effective as possible? So making sure that we have people who are looking at that um, and who are best in breed. And then finally, um, Jason Goldman, who was uh, uh, one of the founders of Twitter, um, was brought in to lead the Office of Digital Strategy. And he's really leading that focus on engagement with the American people and uh, doing that through the Office of Digital Strategy. Already done a, a bunch of things, including launching the at POTUS uh, Twitter account, um, which you could see even over uh, last weekend. Um, there, there's a level of engagement and just personal uh, response that is uh, different from what we were able to do before. So it's a, that's a really um, uh, hopeful uh, thing. We also have Todd Park, our former uh, second US CTO in Silicon Valley leading a recruiting effort. So as I say, we believe strongly that people are a major part of the solution to these issues. So bringing more and more talented people within government is really what Todd's all about. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump to, uh, to talking a little bit about uh, our open government work and your open government work. Um, and I wanna just point out Corey Zarek, who is in the audience um, and should stand up so that she can be more embarrassed. Uh, but <laughs> Corey um, has been at the archives and is uh, a detailee over to um, the team CTO and is really leading our open government efforts um, and it has an encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of this stuff um, and has been really pushing. And both uh, Corey and the, uh, the National Archives have been real leaders when it comes to making more information accessible to the public uh, and getting it out there. So I just wanted to acknowledge and thank that. Um, so as you know, the, the Open Government Initiative was launched, uh, uh, he, the President had a very busy first day in office. It was another one of the things that he launched in his first day of office. We are um, working through the Open Government Directive and getting the agencies on a path to increase the amount of information and the amount of understanding that the public has for what government is actually working on. Um, it's also uh, something that has moved a ton of uh, data and information out into the public space where other people, not the government, can produce everything from uh, the most trivial uh, app to an important open government um, uh, monitor of something that we're doing. Uh, there's one that's, uh, that's out there that is top of my mind, uh, which is just a, a thing that shows when the different We the People petitions have been answered and holds us accountable to not answering the ones that have been out there for a long time. So all, it's, it's everything from the stuff that we would never have imagined that makes a huge difference in people's lives and at the most grand scale, this is um, 
uh, then uh, NOAA releases a ton of data that is used in all the different weather apps that are out there that are very uh, important, but making sure that we do a lot more of that. Uh, and then another piece of this work is, is uh, working with the Open Government Partnership, which is a 65 country initiative that brings government and civil society together across national boundaries and making sure that the United States continues to be a leader in open government over time. And then finally, the national action plans. Uh, we're in the process of formulating our third national action plan. Uh, the previous two national action plans um, have been very successful, including the formation of the uh, declassification board uh, as one of the uh, recommendations in the second national action plan, I think. Am I getting that right, Corey? I'm getting it wrong. Classification Reform Committee. I'm sorry about that. Um, see, this is the great thing about having Corey actually in the audience. <laughs> um, but there is always more to be done within this space. Um, and so one of the things that Corey has been working really hard on is the National Action Plan 3.0. Um, and we would be interested in hearing any suggestions that people have for inclusion in that National Action Plan and making sure that we're pushing as much as we can uh, towards continuing to make government more open and more responsive to people. Um, so with that, I will sit down because I'm really excited to hear about the technology that's coming up. Um, and uh, um, just thank you all for, uh, for letting me speak. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much for that great summary. It's really extraordinary how government is changing. Um, we're still behind the private sector, but catching up uh, rapidly. And I think we're going to all benefit from the initiatives that you're leading um, at the White House. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Cheryl Martin, a research scientist and director of the Center for Content Learning at the Applied Research uh, Laboratories located at the University of Texas. Uh, Dr. Martin's areas of expertise and list of accomplishments are vast. And through her work at the Applied Research Lab, She's applied data mining, detection, inference technologies to information assurance problems, including document declassification. And uh, the board of the PIDIB had a chance to travel down, um, I guess it was last fall, to uh, visit uh, UT and saw firsthand this revolutionary technology. And I think I speak for all the board members to, when we, I say that we were deeply impressed with it. And this morning, Dr. Martin will share with us how she's using this technology as semantic knowledge models, natural language processing, expert systems, and machine learning to categorize and label text. And her recent work has been successful in automatically determining whether documents contain sensitive information that must be protected. And the pilot she's conducted in partnership with the National Archives and the Central Intelligence Agency have significant impact for declassification and other information management activities. And as our reports have documented, it's only through technologies such as this that we are going to be able to manage the vast amount of information that is now in the government. It's simply not sustainable in the two eyes looking at every page system. So in order to have the public have access to what its government does, it has to be automized. And Dr. Martin has figured out a, a very effective way of doing it. Um, as far as we can tell, this, this technology is the only one that has the level of sophistication operating for the sole purpose of modernizing declassification and classification. And uh, we're concerned that right now there's no plan to take it forward. Um, and so we really hope that we can find a way uh, that you can continue and even expand on this important uh, work. So thank you for coming and let me invite you up to talk about your exciting project. Thank you. I'd like to thank the board for inviting me to speak today. It's a real honor to be here. Um, in this presentation, I will first highlight some efforts under the President's National Action Plan, and I will introduce the role that the Center for Content Understanding has in this work. Um, then I will define the field of content understanding, and I will describe our approach for sensitive content identification and marking um, to provide decision support for classification and declassification. Um, the next thing I'll do finally is walk through some of the pilot projects we've been working on in this area 
and I will um, discuss specific progress that we've made with the Reagan email collection. So one of the commitments that uh, is included in the Obama administration's second Open Government National Action Plan is the quoted item here, which was to pilot technology to analyze classified presidential records. It specifically calls out application to um, email records from the Reagan administration, and it identifies the Central Intelligence Agency and NARA as the responsible agencies. These agencies brought in our research organization, the Center for Content Understanding, uh, to help with this work. The Center for Content Understanding is part of the Applied Research Laboratories at the University of Texas at Austin. ARL is established as a University Affiliated Research Center, or UARC, and we're formally associated with the Navy, but we work with organizations throughout the government. Um, all UARCs have defined as part of their charter a set of core competencies which are identified as essential capabilities um, for the U.S. government. And in 2012, ARL's, one of ARL's core competencies was identified as content understanding based on a growing body of work in that area that we had accomplished. And the Center for Content Understanding um, was formally established at that time. So what is content understanding? Um, the dictionary definitions would indicate that it's comprehension of something contained. In the field of content understanding, the containers are artifacts that people create as part of their work or their daily life. And the content in these is the information that's encoded. We determine whether this information is understood by assessing actions that are taken on the information. So when a person observes an artifact, let's see if I can get the when a person observes an artifact, we hypothesize that they combine things that they already know about the world with the information in the artifact and create some meaning. But for, even for a person, we can't directly observe that meaning that's inside their head and tell if it's right or wrong. So we rely on tests of uh, what they do with that information to assess understanding. So actions can be taken that demonstrate understanding, and if people uh, perform well on these, such as making a correct decision on a multiple choice test, then we say that that's sufficient evidence of understanding. In the same way, we assess whether a computer provides con has content understanding by looking at the actions it takes. So if a computer can observe an artifact and demonstrate appropriate inferences, then we consider that as content understanding. The main point of all this is that in content understanding, we're primarily concerned with having computers do helpful things with artifacts like documents. Which brings us to the application of decision support as it applies to classification and declassification. So we're faced with an exponentially growing volume of records, and each of these must be initially classified, managed, and ultimately reviewed for release. Manual efforts to perform these functions are becoming overwhelmed, and technology can help people perform these functions. Specifically, automation can help humans work more efficiently by drawing their attention to critical um, questions and highlighting items that it would take people a long time to scan for in documents. It can also make humans more effective by bringing to bear external information, such as lists of names or projects that not every human has memorized. And it can do this in a wide variety of topics across a number of organizational equities at the same time, so that review critical information can be recognized and identified as quickly as possible. So computers excel at time-consuming, onerous tasks that people don't like and don't necessarily excel at and they produce very consistent results. And this allows humans to do the things they enjoy more and the things they're better at, such as making complex review judgments. The decision support technology that we're developing right now is targeted to identify all the information in a document that's relevant to a classification or a review decision and highlight this information uh, and organize it for consideration by the human reviewers. 
So this is an initial model that's only targeted toward decision support. Um, under this model, we would still need the same human review staff, but we would need far less humans per document, um, which would address the volume problem. The approach that we use for decision support is based on marking up a document to indicate where the sensitive information resides. The name of our uh, approach is SKIM for Sensitive Content Identification and Marking. And it essentially skims a document to identify all the rules or categories that apply to the document. Um, it not only identifies the conclusions corresponding to these rules and categories, but it also identifies the text from the document that support those rules. So, for example, in this document, um, rule one is identified as applying. It not only says the rule applies, but it identifies the highlighted yellow text from the document as the support for this rule. So this allows SCIM to provide a rationale for why it says that rule applies. SCIM uses a combination of technologies to achieve this goal. Natural language processing, or NLP, is used to extract information from the document and put it into a machine processable data format. In the process of doing that, it extracts entities and events and relationships from the document. Um, expert systems technology is then used to apply if-then rules to the information extracted and determine whether it is sensitive or not. Machine learning can also be applied if you have a set of documents that are known to contain sensitive information that you are interested in finding, then it can build a model of those and then identify new documents that are similar. And what ties all this together is a common semantic knowledge representation that allows us to encode background information and make inferences. There are a number of organizations that do good work in this area. And um, what is unique about the SCIM approach is that we combine all these technologies together and we specifically configure it to identify information of interest. So here are some examples, which may be a little difficult to read from the back of the room, but I'll point out the critical areas. Here are some examples of the sensitive content that uh, SCIM can identify. Uh, in this um, example, the information that's deemed sensitive is um, for demonstration purposes, identified to be uh, any discussions of a seismic event in Asia. So we'd clearly want to see and review the document on the left, which talks about an earthquake in China. But we're not so much interested in recipes for earthquake cakes on the right. Um, so the concept, the, the distinguish, um, being able to distinguish between the concept of earthquake as a seismic event and the word earthquake is the key. And most tools that reviewers have to use are focused on text string searches that don't distinguish between these two instances of earthquake. Um, so using NLP technology, we are able to, we'd be able to pick up on earth, the word earthquake only when it means the seismic event. Um, this approach of identifying the concept also allows us to pick up the bottom example where the word quake is used to reference a seismic event, but um, this would be missed in a text string search for earthquake. So we're able to find the concepts. We're also able to identify specific cases where the concepts are sensitive. So in this example, if the earthquake occurred in Europe, that would not be de deemed sensitive under this configuration, even though the correct earthquake concept is discussed. So over the years, we've applied the SCIM approach in three major types of configurations, um, which I'll talk about in detail for the remainder of the presentation. The first application was a proof of concept to help people determine what the portion marking for classification would be to apply to a paragraph in a new document. In this case, the sensitive information that we identified um, was something that would relate to information associated with a rule in a classification guide. The second, second application was to support quality assurance review for declassification, and in this case, the sensitive information was um, things that reviewers had identified as things they wanted to take another look at in this QA process. And the third application is underway now, and this is targeted toward identifying 
uh, equity information across multiple agencies in the government um, where the sensitive, uh, sensitive information in this case is identified by each government agency as the equity or the information that they deem may be uh, in need of protection. Each of these three pilot efforts uh, use the exact same reasoning engine or back end. Really the only difference among the applications is how it's presented to the user and the configuration for what is considered sensitive. Um, this diagram visualizes that similarity. Um, SKIM is really designed as a service. So it takes in the information uh, from, a, from a document and it provides the marked up information back. So if you can get text to it, then it can provide this information that then can be used in the user's normal workflow on a user interface or for a sorting algorithm to help the user do their job. Um, I'll discuss specific examples of this uh, types of user interfaces and configuration as I walk through the uh, pilot projects. The first pilot project was designed to support portion marking um, as a decision support. In this case, the user interface was a document authoring tool like a word processor and each paragraph was processed by SKIM and SKIM would suggest all the rules that applied from an encoded set of derivative classification guides. As typical in the SKIM approach, not only would the suggested classification be identified, but it would also identify which rule from the classification applied as well as why the rationale for why it applied um, from the text. These were presented to the user and they could accept or override this suggestion and once the selection was made, the user interface would apply the selected portion mark. In this particular application, um, we didn't just present information to the user and allow them to select. There was also a direct feedback to the SKIM service that will allow users to define or clarify terms on the fly and make suggestions for improving SKIM, or SKIM um, performance in the future. So we learned a number of things from this initial pilot. Um, the, first of all, we did achieve extremely high accuracy on the test cases that we use. Um, since this was a, such a small uh, set of test cases, we couldn't claim this performance in general, but it was a highly successful proof of the concept. Um, we also ran into some challenges. First of all, identifying what the right answer was that the computer should provide was actually fairly difficult. Um, we had the test documents and they had the portion marks in them which described what the classification level was, but we needed to know more than the classification level. We needed to know why, you know, which rule from which guide makes this classified and where's the text that says that rule applies. Um, so we went to the subject matter experts and said, please tell us these things. And um, this would have been fine except subject matter experts know how to classify, but like most people who know how to do things, they just know. And <laughs> when, when you ask them to explain how exactly they knew, you know, people find that difficult to do. Um, and there's also some you know, debate amongst the subject matter experts about what specifically was the rationale um, for making these classification uh, decisions. Um, so this leads to the next lesson that we learned, which is that since classification guidance is written to be interpreted by humans, it often lacks the specificity and the precision that a computer needs to make a determination. Um, finally, the um, thing that really shifted, uh, uh, kind of brought this to a close is that we were ultimately not able to justify access to additional test data. Um, the test data that we had used um, was from publications that were classified, like journal articles or newsletters, and the need-to-know issues had kind of already been resolved by the publica that publication. Um, but ultimately, we weren't able to justify a broader access to classify documents to just to do this research. So then we turned to declassification because in that application, the primary mission is the review and the access, the need for the access to documents was clear. Um, so, in the second application, 
we um, provided oops, a decision support. Um, we've provided decision support for a, qual a quality assurance process for declassification. Uh, once manual review is complete in this process, the documents are sent to the SKIM service, which marks up the sensitive information that warrants another look in the quality assurance pr process. In this particular quality assurance process, the documents selected for review in the quality assurance phase are not a random selection. They were all the documents that contain this particular sensitive information that they wanted to double check. Um, before the SKIM application was deployed, the way they were selecting these documents was to use a list of dirty words and they would select a page if it contained any of those um, dirty words. We were able to take the SKIM output and feed it into a user interface that the reviewers had previously already been using for review that was the dirty word user interface. So if a document, um, if earthquake was one of the words on the old dirty word list and we found earthquake in one of the highlighted areas of support in the document, then we present that page to the user. But if the document talked about earthquake cakes and earthquake wasn't in any of the highlighted sensitive content, then we wouldn't present that to the user. Um, we were also able to update the user interface to also highlight the con important context information that we found when we were, um, when, when these rules fired. And that sped up the decision process for the reviewers. Um, they qualitatively felt like this feature made them much more efficient in the review for the documents that were presented to them. In terms of quantifying the efficiency improvements that we ch achieved in terms of page selection, we ran a test, a comparison between how the dirty word um, selection did versus the skim selection on a set of about 160,000 test pages. So we defined the ideal performance or ground truth here um, where out of all the 160,000 pages, only about 8,000 of them contained this information that they wanted to subject to the quality assurance process. Um, when we ran the dirty word list against these pages, it selected a huge number of pages for quality assurance review. That's almost two-thirds of the pages that were in the collection overall. But the good news is that the dirty word selection did, um, a, did select the ones that they wanted to see, as shown by that green area that's still there. But the bad news is that it provided a ton of extra work for the reviewers looking at earthquake cakes when all they wanted to see were seismic events called earthquakes. Um, so, also the dirty word list missed a few, very small, uh, less than 200 pages, um, and that's instances where an alternate terminology like quake was being used. Um, so, our goal in this application was to decrease this white area significantly, and give the reviewers less work, not miss any of the, keep the green area at least the same, and if possible, reduce that red area as well. And that's essentially what we were able to do. Specifically, um, we significantly reduced the unnecessary work that the reviewers had to do by reducing the false positives. Um, we also didn't miss any of the previously correct pages and we were able to identify alternate terminology and pick up some of the um, pages that the dirty word list was previously missing. Um, so we kept the green area the same and we found 90%, 6% of the previously missed pages. So overall we were really happy with this effort and the reviewers seemed to like it too. Um, this work, this is the work that we extended to apply to the Reagan emails. The concept that we're working toward for the presidential emails is um, for equity ID, to, to provide the ability to identify multiple agencies' equity in a collection of documents at the same time. Um, presidential records are likely to contain equities from multiple organizations and, and individual documents within those are also likely to mix information from multiple agencies. If we can identify those equities 
accurately with the automation, we can potentially um, make the referral process um, better and faster. Um, and once the sensitive information is identified, this could be passed along to the individual agencies um, and help speed up their review process as well. We had to do some initial work on the emails before we could begin testing with it for equity ID. Um, the emails came from backup tapes that were um, preserved at the end of the Reagan administration from an email system called Profs. And um, a set of about 80,000 emails were preserved and restored. Unfortunately, the email format for these restored emails was very difficult to read. They're, the emails were linked together in one long bit stream that um, it was very difficult to tell where one, start, one email started and another email began. Um, so the initial part of our effort with these emails was to convert them into a usable data format and identify the threading relationships among the emails. Um, we ultimately created human uh, readable image formats of these emails that we could then use to um, put through the formal review process that currently exists. We completed all of those um, processing tasks and delivered the emails back to NARA, and at that point we could uh, apply SKIM to test out the equity ID uh, concept. We were able to demonstrate that proof of concept to the board last September, and the initial results were encouraging. We um, qualitatively, the sensitive information that we identified did seem to correctly pick out things that warranted referral. Um, the formal review of the emails is currently underway, and this manual review will provide us ground truth that we can, uh, for which emails contain to its equities, so that we can assess the performance of the SKIM tool. Um, while this is ongoing, we're working with the subject matter experts to uh, improve the SKIM tool's performance and add additional equities to the coverage. Um, this fall, we will take the ground truth that, we're, um, that the reviewers have produced to that point and we will quantify and validate the SKIM's performance. By the end of the year, we hope to document and quantify success for this concept. Um, and that will wrap up our efforts. Um, at this point, I'd like to credit my wonderful staff of researchers and software engineers who make all this technology work and acknowledge the reviewers who have helped us out as well as the organizations who have funded uh, and supported this work over the years. Um, and I'd like to thank the board for advocating technology to help with these important classification and declassification decisions and having me here to speak today. Um, thank you all for listening and um, I hope that you find this work encouraging. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. We will have time for questions um, at the end of the discussion if, if those of you want to address something directly to Dr. Martin. And as I said, we're very impressed with these breakthroughs, and we really want to see a continued partnership uh, between the CCU and the agencies involved so that uh, this great work is carried on and, and it filters through the rest of the challenges on the declassification in, in particular. Um, we're now going to hear from the PIDB um, board, meritus, uh, board members and emeritus members. If I could invite um, everyone up here, we'll hear from various members who would like to comment. And I think um, we're going to actually start with Laura. So I'd invite all the board members up. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, it's a true privilege to serve on this board and I'm honored by the trust the president and his administration have put in me by appointing me to it. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Cheryl and AMAC and um, for your really interesting presentations this morning. That was incredibly informative and so interesting. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to say a heartfelt thanks to my fellow board members and the PIDB staff for their warm welcome. Um, everyone has been so helpful to my process of getting up to speed, and I look forward to working with each of you. Um, I just have a couple of remarks, and then I'll pass it on to Saul. Um, as we start our work together, I'm hopeful that my professional background in technology and information businesses will prove helpful to our 
areas of concern and focus. In particular, I look forward to bringing the benefit of my experiences, particularly my time at Google on Book Search and with the libraries that participated in that project, as well as my work subsequently on the Digital Public Library of America. On a personal note, um, issues of information management and questions of access and usability of information have interested me for a long time, like many of the people in this room. I grew up in a small town in southern New Hampshire and haunted my local public library as a kid. <laughs> the access that little library and its devoted librarians provided me to a wide range of books and information is central to who I am and what I've been able to do in my life. <clears throat> as I get more up to speed on the work of the, I think you're saying it, PDIB, not P-I-D-B, <laughs> PDIB, I hope to contribute meaningfully, particularly in the area of technology and technology applications. We had a very useful meeting of the technology working group last month with a broad range of agency participants. It was exciting to see how much work is already being done, and I look forward to future meetings of the working group. Serving on this board is a very exciting opportunity, and I look forward to working with the broader community of agencies and public interest groups that are engaged with these critical issues. I feel tremendously privileged to be working on and for and on behalf of the public as a member of this board. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Solomon Watson, and as a first step, I'd like to thank President Obama for um, appointing me to this very important board. It's a privilege and honor to serve the country in this area of declassification and classification. <clears throat> Nothing is more important to the country than maintaining its national security. Equally important is ensuring that our members of the public understand how the government operates in that area. Along with Laura, I'd like to thank the members of the board and the Information Security Oversight Office for welcoming us aboard. My general interest in government operations and national security came into focus in 1971 when the New York Times and later the Washington Post published over government objections the so-called Pentagon Papers case. You may recall that those uh, papers uh, came about as a study authorized by uh, Robert McNamara. Uh, those papers indicated more than a national security interest, a historical interest and involvement of our government in the affairs of uh, Vietnam, including the political affairs and the, um, obviously the, the, the conduct of the Vietnam War. The publication of the papers uh, resulted in a great decision for freedom of the press and the public's right to know. They also uh, increased a growing skepticism about allegations from the government using national security as a defense or a classification modality to hide political decisions. I spent most of my career as a lawyer in the New York Times Company Legal Department, and there one of our primary obligations was to give legal advice to members of the newsroom when they requested it on legal implications of publications of stories, frequently stories, <coughs> that uh, came about as a result of leaks of classified information uh, to our newsroom. As a member of the board for three months, this is my first public meeting, and I must say I'm uh, very excited about it. It's been a, an exciting and successful meeting. Um, it appears to me from my other meetings, executive meetings and this public meeting, that there's a widely held recognition of the need and the willingness to go forward in this area of classification and declassification. While there are a number of challenges, including particularly on the technology side, it appears to me that there's a collaborative and collegial effort among the stakeholders, including the intelligence community, NGOs, and citizens generally, to make great progress. And I think uh, the board, has shown that as a convener of communities and an inspirational organization, that it has a continuing and important role to play. Um, I'm certain that um, I will contribute my efforts as a citizen interested in public information and as a former executive of the New York Times Company to those efforts. Thank you. 
Um, good morning, David Skaggs. I'm, uh, uh, as the recovering politician on the board, I'm authorized um, to both be pretentious and to engage in awkward metaphors, so bear with me. Um, but uh, Marty and Bill and I were on board, so to speak, from the get-go and are now uh, transitioning into emeritus status, but uh, thankfully are able to come back and kibitz a bit on the work of the board and I hope continue to make contributions, but it's been a great privilege for me to, to serve on this board for however many years it's been now since we got stood up. Um, I think I'm here because of my time on the Intelligence Committee in the House serving with then uh, regular member Nancy Pelosi and making a, a, a somewhat uh, questionable reputation as having a fetish about overclassification. So it, it was um, interesting to probe during closed hearings about the sources and rationale for classification decisions that were in documents presented to the committee. And so I've been paying the price for that role now for uh, many years, but enjoying it all. Uh, but the pretentiousness comes just from, um, you know, it's, it's so easy to sort of lapse into uh, dealing with uh, the grassroots of the business of government and uh, losing track of you know, what we're all about, and particularly as a representative of the uh, legislative branch of government, if you will, the uh, uniqueness of American political philosophy at its origins, and maybe still as a system in which the people are the sovereign. And we are all accountable to and, rep and, and uh, need to bear in mind our accountability to the public and that can only happen if it has access to the information that its government develops in its name as much as we can possibly effectuate. So that's, um, you know, I sort of see this board as in a critical role in, uh, in that fundamental responsibility of, uh, of the democracy. And so it's, uh, you know, you, you get into the nuts and bolts of classification decisions and sometimes forget about that. So I, and so important for us to have these regular public meetings to remind us and you that that's what this is about. Um, the awkward metaphor, which I won't dwell on too long because it just occurred to me this morning, is that um, classified information is sort of the uh, cholesterol of, uh, of the government vascular system. And, um, and this board is trying to do stents <laughs> uh, and get rid of plaque and get the system flowing well. Bill, Bill thought we could talk about a different organic system of the human body that would be <laughs> less pleasant, but we won't go there. Um, former, former military, what do you think? Right, right, right. Um, so we're hoping that the stents will avoid the need for, you know, triple bypass for government. Um, finally, uh, one of the things that's been uh, a happy occasion for me in this job uh, in the executive branch of government is to be reminded about the, uh, the faithful and extraordinarily diligent service of civil servants uh, who are often derided by my former colleagues on the Hill uh, but do the work of this nation day in and day out. So this is a call out for John Powers who's in the audience and who was on the staff of ISU for many years and helped this organization do its work. So John, stand up and accept our thanks. And you're invited to lunch. Can you hear? I'm uh, Bill Studeman. I'm, uh, uh, one of the new emeritus uh, individuals going off the board after nine years as a congressional appointee. Um, so I've been on the board for a very long period of time through the three major reports and as part of my departure homework assignment carrying over into the emeritus uh, environment, I've been asked to chair the technology working group which Laura referred to uh, before and we've actually already had uh, one meeting, and so I thought I'd talk a little bit about 
<clears throat> some of the philosophy behind that and then where we think the technology working group will be going. I'm sort of a, 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 a subscriber of the notion of management by nagging and I think pretty much what the PIDB does is, is it does nagging and, and facilitation uh, to try to get the government to uh, move in the right policy direction and of course now as we move into the digital era, this technology underpinning, which AMAC talked about this morning, is really critical to this entire future of uh, managing classified records. Uh, the old system that we've had, which we've written about in reports, is not a sustainable system, uh, in my own personal view, and we've said that. Uh, the volume, the veracity, uh, the velocity, the nature and character of digital records is going to be uh, present to the declassifiers a dramatically different world. We entered that world actually 25 years ago. I was the director of NSA when we fought Desert Storm. That's 24 and a half years ago, coming up now for the declassification period. Uh, we fought that war <clears throat> in a digital uh, way, so it was really the first digital war. Uh, that said, the permanent records are analog, and so they obviously had to be converted from digital form to, to uh, text uh, record form. And the irony of that is, of course, we've now specified going back for emails in 2016 to digital format, and then after that, fully digital. So the records in this period of time will go from digital to analog and ultimately back to digital at, at no uh, small cost. Uh, to the process. Um, so this is an exciting period of having to look at this last 25 years and the implications of it. And also in that period of time, of course, the information age exploded and the media on which these records were kept uh, uh, have, have all aged and disappeared and there's a, a whole series of issues about even finding the records uh, from that period of time uh, if they weren't uh, put to paper. So um, I think that uh, my message is that this uh, technology working group uh, is going to work in several areas. One is obviously um, uh, the issue we talked about this morning, the search for applicable tools and technology that can help with the, uh, the whole panoply of issues associated with uh, uh, managing classified information and records. So this is not just uh, declassification tools, but this is understanding the architectures uh, and the environments in which these records are kept. And of course, as you're aware, virtually everybody's going to the cloud. The cloud will probably be the dominant architecture for the future. It offers real opportunities for um, storage, for large application stores and um, search techniques and other aids to dealing with information in a big data environment that we've never had before. So we will be looking at where those tools might be. That means that we're going to have to go probably out to universities uh, beyond the national, the laboratory project that's going on right now and also go onto the public private side to the information masters in Silicon Valley and elsewhere who have the technology that can help us along in this area. And our job is really to try to ensure that the government agencies who have classified holdings are, are in fact paying attention to this in the sort of the nagging mode, facilitating mode that is the way of life in the PIDB. Um, the next thing uh, uh, we need to do is to track where these agencies actually are in the rollout of their own future architectures. So we have, uh, in this first uh, uh, technology working group meeting, we went into the Intel community and had a deep dive into the iSight project, the intelligence community IT enterprise upgrade. Uh, we did a deep dive on the archives electronic records program. We're looking for convergence and divergence and trying to facilitate uh, understanding on the part of everybody about where everybody else is going. We had a large contingent of uh, OSD people there representing 42 um, agencies, departments, services, etc. in the Department of Defense that hold classified <laughs> records. Uh, they remind us that 75% uh, of the classified records are in the Department of Defense and there are plenty of issues over there, uh, including their issues on Kyle Lott between OSD and the Department of Energy on uh, RDFRD. So there's a whole series of important issues and we hope to hear more from them 
for the future about where the Department uh, of, de of Defense is going. Of course, you recognize that these new uh, architectures that are coming out are coming out um, essentially at a, as a sort of a chapeau on top of hundreds and hundreds of systems that lie underneath them. And that's really where a lot of these records are, are, are or are going to be. So there's some issue about resolving all that. Uh, so three different things, a search for technology, uh, looking at the existing architectures and trying to help with some facilitation around with the holders. We'll look at state next, energy, et cetera. Uh, try to get them involved. And then look at the state of records and the issues that are associated with that. And as you know from our earlier studies, as we try to move from the as-is to the to-be, for which there needs to be some kind of strategy, overarching strategy, which is reflected in policy, um, we, we need to be careful about divining some core principles for declassification and identifying the specific issues that exist in that transition from the, from the essentially the analog uh, to the future digital era where we can have a lot of support. And then we can move into some of the objective areas where we're looking at uh, things like early declassification inside the 25-year point. And uh, so there should be an exciting time. Uh, I, <clears throat> I was uh, struck as the presentation was being given on the CCU that, that uh, the people who do declassification can no longer be just policy and sociological declassifiers. Without the technology people to work the software to provide all the, the, uh, the uh, required implementations that uh, deal with all that, uh, there will not be a future in declassification. So you have to have the technology people added to the people who are doing the job right now who can do all that configuration management and all the other kinds of things that are going to be required. So this is a, a, a significant challenge. The one final thing I would say also is this is all being done in a down budget environment. And the down budget environment means that we have to organize the collective, the collective of intelligence declassifiers, the collective of defense classifiers, et cetera, into a more common uh, kind of framework uh, so that there's information sharing, uh, really understanding across uh, everybody uh, about what everybody else is doing. So we have this huge task of trying to ride the wave of IT for the future, which offers all this promise, organize for success so we can get some economy of scale out of the hole, keeping in mind that when I came on this board nine years ago, we were just introducing declassifiers in the intelligence community to each other. So I, I think we've actually come a long way in that uh, period of time. And so the challenge ahead uh, for the board is to sustain and accelerate uh, around the objectives for this technology working group, which I think is going to be the core part of our effort uh, as technology relates to policy for the future. So thank you very much. I'm Marty Fagan. As, as was said, I joined the board uh, at its inception in 2006. Uh, because Bill Leary appointed me with the support of the president. Uh, and I think he did that because uh, I'm a person who actually declassified something, which was the existence of the NRO that I announced publicly in 1992 after a classified existence of 31 years, a few years of which it was actually secret. Uh, a point which I was able to convince the DCI, the Secretary of Defense, and ultimately the president. Uh, in 1992. I'll observe that 23 years later, there are people in the NRO who still criticize me for that. <laughs> I've always been interested in declassification because I served in the 1980s uh, on the House Intelligence Committee and sat on the sideline in the staff seats as all the contemporary history of intelligence was being presented to the committee year after year after year, all being carefully recorded verbatim in a classified record and thinking, what an incredible story for the American people to hear an appropriate moment of declassification. Um, you know, virtually the whole history of not only intelligence, but all that intelligence learned about foreign affairs and uh, uh, military affairs. As a technologist, I have always been interested in the kind of work that Dr. Martin is doing, 
and in this digital age understand that it will be imperative to doing classification and declassification, and in fact, intelligence analysis um, in this age. Uh, we've been pushing this for a long time. One of the concerns that public interest groups have expressed is that we were going to go to total automation and human brain, human decision making would no longer be involved. You said it very well, it's a decision aid, a decision support aid. I saw some early work in this almost 30 years ago in map making, uh, which stuck with me as it brought together uh, technology and a skilled analyst and made that analyst vastly more productive and increased the interest content uh, of the work that, uh, that she was doing. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> just a couple of brief comments about the uh, <coughs> CCU project that you heard about this morning, uh, which impressed all of us enormously when we got a much more detailed uh, briefing from Cheryl in Texas. I think, certainly we're convinced, I think the CIA is convinced that this concept has been proved. It works. And what is most striking about the work they have done is that they have shown that not only do these uh, approaches, these techniques, these technologies improve the efficiency of declassification reviewers and classifiers. They improve the quality of their work just as much as they improve the efficiency of their work. You get better results. Uh, so our great hope, concern, is to make sure that these proved concepts get applied and used as soon as possible. It'll be a big leap for most of the uh, classification community to trust the computer to make the right decision. But we're, gonna, we're gonna have to get to that, and the, the sooner the better. <clears throat> uh, one final point, I think the, the uh, uh, public interest groups and the audience ought to be as impressed as we are with these potential tools, these real tools, potentially applicable. Uh, and <clears throat> I hope they'll use their influence whatever way they can to ensure that the funding for this project continues, as we will try to do as well. Uh, we're going to open it up for public comments in a moment. Uh, I want to just echo what Admiral Studeman said on the technology uh, committee that he's driving. I think it's going to um, do more than just put pressure on things, but to really open people's eyes to the uh, possibilities. And as Bill Leary said, the only way forward in addressing the issue of classification and declassification is technology. When, when I started looking at this some time ago, I thought we'd have to convince declassifiers to be less risk averse and take technology. Um, it's the other way around. It's less risky to use technology because humans make mistakes. As Cheryl said, machines can do this ad infinitum and we get tired and make mistakes. So it actually is uh, more accurate, less risk averse, uh, more efficient and cheaper, and it's the wave of the future. So again, um, thank you for being ahead of the curve on all of this. Um, Bill Leary and I wanted to just take a moment to recognize um, our fellow members and uh, emeritus members, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. So Bill will lead that off. I'll start by uh, asking Laura and uh, Saul to come get your presidential commissions. Um, you, uh, I, I talked earlier about uh, the uh, sterling qualifications uh, that they both have for this job. Uh, one, one thing in particular you both have that the rest of us almost to completely do not have, <clears throat> and that is they made their careers outside of government, not inside. So you will bring a very useful perspective in addition to all your expertise to, to this undertaking. Th these are your commissions uh, signed by the president uh, for this important undertaking. We look forward to working with them. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to do it. <laughs> thank you. 
Um, I was going to embarrass John Powers before David Skaggs did it, but um, I, I have to add a commendation to John. John has actually uh, left the archives, but has gone over to a more powerful position where he can continue to help us as Director of Access Management at the National Security staff um, working with John Ficklin, who's hiding over there in a chair. Uh, John, maybe you wave too. Um, but really, John, thank all of us. We're going to embarrass you a little bit further this afternoon, but thank you. Um, you leave a big hole over here, but I know your heart's moved into a bigger place to help us even more. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just take a minute and acknowledge um, and recognize the service of Bill Studeman, David Skaggs, and Marty Fega, who have really been the heart and soul of the uh, PIDB. And you've each completed your third and final members a term. And this is our past, last public meeting with you. So we wanted to just take a minute and commend your work and give you a little present. Um, all three of you began members in the early 2000s, as you've mentioned, uh, when the board was in its infancy, and I think you've helped shape it and define it into uh, the force that it is today. Um, you've helped write all the reports and recommendations to date, and as uh, one of the newer members to this board, your guidance has been extraordinary. And each of the reports that we've put out reflects their, their heart and soul, your passion and advocacy for transparency, responsible declassification and your thought-provoking comments has really, I think, made an indelible mark on uh, our efforts to change government. Um, you've spent many, many hours of dedicated service, um, not only on this board, but in other uh, public service roles and jobs and leave a lasting uh, mark on this country. Um, in addition to his years in the Navy, Admiral Studeman was uh, where I first met you, actually, as the director of the National Security Agent and uh, director, uh, deputy director of the CIA, as well as an acting director for a little bit. Um, David Skagg served as uh, 12 years in the House of Representatives from Colorado's second district, where his heart always is. Mm -hmm. um, and he was six years on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, so has been an invaluable uh, voice of wisdom, reason, and, and prodding on many occasions that I think we, we've needed. And of course, Marty Fega was the 10th director of the National Reconnaissance Office, which we can now, as he mentioned, publicly talk about. Um, and I think the set the stage for uh, putting out the public's right to know that the NRO um, existed. So these are just a, um, a small way of saying thank you, but we'd like to um, have you come and we just have a small um, uh, gift for you. And with the assistant of the archivist who I guess just left, um, <laughs> we, um, we've made reproductions of the several, seven samples of secret ink um, that you can take with you. <laughs> And this is one of my favorite things. This report is dated October 30, 1917, and it was classified as confidential for many years. Um, and it details description of secret writing techniques. Um, for instance, in April uh, 2011, um, the CIA finally declassified this information and made it public. And it, so this is uh, thought to be the oldest classified record held by the government, and it was created in 1917. We thought that this would be a, an appropriate remembrance of your time here. And uh, with that, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for your dedicated service, and here's a little gift for you. for its important uh, points on its documents. It's a black highlighter. So <laughs> so. um, okay, now we've finally gotten to the reason that you're all here is for the um, public comments. We'd like very much to 
um, hear from all of you. We have about a half an hour to take questions. You can direct them at um, any of us sitting up here, Dr. Martin, and I will cut you off if you turn it into a speech. So thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Aftergood with the Federation of American Scientists. Um, I wanted to uh, caution against putting the technology cart ahead of the policy horse. I was struck by Dr. Martin's um, remark that the classification guidance um, that she receives is often um, lacking in specificity and clarity um, of the kind that's needed for the computer. I think it's also lacking in the clarity that's needed for human classifiers, and it's, um, it accounts for much of the overclassification that takes place. Um, I don't want to identify a problem without proposing a solution, and I think there is a potential solution in the upcoming fundamental classification guidance review that is already required by executive order. Under the terms of that review, every classification instruction in every one of the thousands of classification guides throughout government is supposed to be reviewed by executive branch agencies. And I would suggest that this is an opportunity to refine that classification guidance and to give it the kind of clarity and specificity that Dr. Martin needs and that the rest of us expect. Um, if we have vague, confusing guidance um, of the kind that I think we do have today, then automating its application is just going to create chaos. So um, uh, Admiral Studeman talked about nagging and, and, and Bill Leary suggested agenda items for public interest groups. I would like to suggest an agenda item for the PITA that you do some nagging um, uh, about the most effective possible implementation of this upcoming Fundamental Classification Guidance Review. Thanks. Of the way in which the uh, inexorable move to greater use of technology will force agencies to refine uh, their classification guidance because, as you say, it won't work unless that happens. Uh, uh, my name is Matthew Connolly. I'm at Columbia University. I work with colleagues in computer science and mathematics on a project we call the Declassification Engine. And I was very interested to um, hear Dr. Martin's presentation. I have a three-parter. Um, one is a uh, number of people have um, pointed out how obviously humans also make errors. There's a project at, in the UK called Project Abaca uh, where people from the National Archives have looked at the, um, the error rate, the intercoder unreliability, um, how it is that humans looking at the same document will redact different things or withhold different documents. So is there any research or any plans for research to establish the baseline so we can know, you know what is the error rate you know, when uh, humans are reviewing documents for declassification? I think that would be quite useful in, in advancing this, this argument for the need for technology. Um, the second part has to do with the presentation itself. So I had some difficulty just evaluating some of the research and I would love to know more. So I'm wondering if there are plans for publication of, of some of the more, more specific aspects of what methods you used and what kind of results you were getting. Um, so is the code gonna become open source? You know, are there plans for publication? I hope anyway that this will become a research field for data scientists, but I think for that to happen, they would have to know more about the kind of data you're using and what kind of results you're getting. Um, the last part is about the funding. Um, so it would be great, right, if there was more uh, support for research in this field. My project is funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, I understand a couple of years ago that DARPA put out a request for proposals for research in this very area, but none of the proposals were funded. So I'm wondering if there's any prospect for funding in this area to support research on automation of declassification for people outside of government. Cheryl, do you want to respond? Um, in this corner. Um, so we haven't actually done any quantification of how much better 
the results are using this um, technology. Um, we have a general feeling that the reviewers are able to do a better job because a lot of the um, meticulousness, that attention they require um, is, is taken out of the equation for them and they're able to focus better. But those are all kind of qualitative feelings. We don't have a baseline of before and after. And um, at this point, we just don't have enough resources to do a long-term study like this. I agree that it would be beneficial to have that before and after data. But there are currently um, no resources to dedicate toward that, and we have not um, previously done that. In terms of um, plans for publication and um, and the code and publication uh, making the code open, um, the technologies that we use are already open source. In fact, most of the fundamental natural language processing and expert systems are um, free because we like free things. Um, uh, technology, really the, the things that we're adding to it is the configuration for the sensitive information. And that gets pretty quickly into what's classified. So um, in terms of making the infrastructure that ties the technologies together open source, that could, um, could be something that happens, but that takes some effort to um, maintain an open source project and kind of service that. And uh, that's just not something we've bitten off. We, um, you know, in terms, that's just a resource constraint on my staff. Um, the third question, I don't have anything to comment on for that. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Matt, for the question. Uh, my name is John Fitzpatrick. I'm the director of the Information Security Oversight Office here at NARA and the executive secretary. We provide all the staff support to the board. So let me take the, the question about resources and um, uh, so it's, there are absolutely the questions that need to be asked, but sort of where we are in the movie right now with regard to uh, proving the concept, I think we've, as Bill said, we're there. Now what do you do with a proven concept? And how does the government uh, accept that this is a possibility and place in its action plan uh, doing something about that possibility? So uh, part of the... Um, uh, board's um, uh, uh, purpose is to, um, I like to say, uh, put wind in the sails of others' efforts. Um, Admiral Studeman says management by nagging. I think those are both the same thing. Um, and w we are um, in a moment, if you will, here by taking the, um, the board's plans to uh, promote and then report on this need uh, for the purpose of getting movement at the government level for a program to do those things, where the, the uh, understanding of how much can be done openly and how much needs to be done in a classified environment can be parsed in programmatic terms, where the re requirements for attention on this in intelligence, in presidential library, in defense, or in other civilian agencies, um, where all of, all of those constituencies perform declassification in a, uh, a standalone way that is connected to each other, how do we take that and make a government program out of it? All of the government agencies doing it do it, but we don't do it in a unified or an integrated program yet with resources, technology, and a strategy that bring those together. So we're trying to get that to happen now. I think the presence of the open government program, the ch chief technology officer of the United States, and the national action plan commitments that progressively drive us down the lane towards doing something, um, that's where we're hoping to take it. So I would say watch this space, and, um, but, but uh, we have to go from, uh, uh, from, we're going from ground up, we've proven the concept, now we've got to uh, get the traction in the, inside the OMB and other places to, to make something of it. Thanks. I seem to remember when we were at Texas, and Cheryl, correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a differential of 15 to 20 percent on the mistake rate, that it was, you know, 80 percent or correct, and it brought it up to 95 percent when you're using the technology. Am I misremembering that? Um, 
Ambassador Soderberg is correct. We did have um, some comparison of before and after for classification portion marking, where um, we had um, looked at what people had done for those small sets of test cases and uh, compared it to the ultimate accuracy that the computer was able to perform. And it was about 80% for people in those small test cases um, in terms of accuracy uh, for the human classifiers, and that's going to vary by person. Um, but um, ultimately, the computer was able to um, achieve almost a 90%, or almost 100, a 98% accuracy rate. So um, we do have a general feeling in terms of the portion marking. We don't have um, quantitative um, results for um, you know, actually finding mistakes in declassification. That's just not something we've um, really pursued as a uh, large study to look for those types of errors that humans may be making. Um, and that's just a resource focus, I think. Um, I have a couple of hands up, uh, one here and one there, and John Ficklin, you may not want to do this, but if you want to, I'll give you a minute to think about it. Uh, if you want to comment on the classification review that the gentleman from Columbia was talking about, if you want to fill us in on where that stands, I'll invite you to do that after the next two comments, or you can pass. So why don't we start there and then uh, back row. Michael Binder, Air Force Declassification Office. There's still a large volume of paper records to be reviewed in College Park and at Suitland. And I'm wondering, does the board feel that automation would be used for these analog records with the attendant requirements for scanning and OCR? Or do you feel that automation should be reserved for the born digital records? I have a mic. Pushing this project on behalf of the CIA. The digitization of the paper is actually very expensive. And because we'd have to then OCR the paper and use somewhat dirty text, then the error rate would get much higher. I don't think that the technology we're proposing is a solution for paper simply because of the processing that would be required on the paper in order to apply the machine concepts to it. But one of the advantages of digitizing the records is it frees up declassifiers to clear up some of the backlog, too. So it's much faster, cheaper, more efficient if we could get this. I think the background. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the dream of standardization of how humans. Can you uh, introduce yourself? Oh, Charles Clarkson, sorry. How uh, humans communicate. I'm reminded of a story. A friend of mine were at NIH and trying to standardize how doctors communicate. And I said, you know, you're getting a doctor to describe symptoms in Boston the same way that a doctor in San Diego describes it. He says, hell, we can't even get two hospitals in Boston to agree on how to do this. And it's really one of the fundamental challenges and weaknesses of the Data Act, uh, trying to have uh, transparency uh, and consistent and standard. They, they, if they can agree, get agreement among federal agencies on terms, they'll never get agreement among all the grantees that money goes to. So, following up on Bill Leary's comment, technology is your only hope in terms of conceptual data mining that can accommodate how asthma can be described 50,000 different ways. Uh, humans will never agree in a moment. Thank you. Do I see any other comments? John, did you want to talk about what was going on there? Good morning, I'm John Ficklin, um, Senior Director for Records and Access Management of the National Security Council staff. Of course, Mr. Aftergood is correct. Uh, we do need to make sure that we get the uh, classification guides correct. Uh, certainly, if the classification guides are, are correct, we can apply that to this technology and, um, and, and really be resourceful. Um, I do have to tell you there was one other comment that, that I've heard multiple times today and, and it's really a top priority for me and, and that's funding, <laughs> money. This all costs money and, um, and I'm committed to do what I can to try to 
uh, ensure that, that, that we do get the money we need to move this project forward. Thank you. John? Yeah, if I'd like to um, also refer back to Steve's comment about the fundamental classification guidance review so that we don't leave it something hanging. This is, um, he's absolutely right, this is an, uh, an opportunity uh, built into the um, executive order. Um, we have been once through the executive branch on this with reports that were completed in the 2012 timeframe and have let us learn some lessons, um, largely uh, in, in owing to the observations of uh, the public and uh, analysts like Steve who've looked at that and said, you know, so what? And how can we get uh, more meaningful so what's out of that? And so um, Steve and I have had a number of conversations on this topic and we have taken uh, those to uh, other folks in the in the business area of classification management. Um, uh, our office will issue uh, guidance to agencies to get them started in the next cycle. And so um, in addition to the input that we've gotten from Steve and uh, what he has, uh, I'll say, put in uh, ideas in your head, hopefully, uh, to, uh, to think about this as well, we'd welcome your input uh, for uh, how meaningful outcomes could come from that review in addition to the ones that we've talked about here. We'll continue to talk about it with the board and ISU and the classification management activities we do in the interagency are already contemplating how to uh, pick the best task for agencies in the conduct of this review so that we get optimal output on the back end. So I didn't, I, I, I want to acknowledge Steve's remark but also say yes, in fact, that dialogue is engaged and um, it is something that we welcome uh, uh, input on as we, as we always do. Thanks. If I going once, any more? Uh, let me pack a pass. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm just going to pass the mic back to Bill Leary, who will close the meeting. Yes, thank you all for coming. Uh, we encourage you to continue to uh, send comments, suggestions, complaints. Um, uh, we have a, a blog called Tra Transforming Classification, where you can uh, you can supply those comments. We uh, urge you to use it because we, we do take seriously the word public uh, in our title and in our mission. Thank you all for coming.